In this lecture, <clears throat> this is the first lecture of module two, which is titled Engineering Principles of the Cell. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about the gen genetic code error minimization. Minimization. So in earlier lectures, I remarked that the genetic code is contingent. In other words, the method by which codon triplets are translated into an amino acid sequence did not have to be the way it was. For example, you have phenylalanine, the code for phenylalanine, sorry, the, tripl the tr codon triplet, one of them, is UUU, and that codes for phenylalanine, P-H-E-N-Y-L, phenylalanine. But there's nothing really fundamental about that decoding. There are no forces of nature, no physical interactions, electrostatic attractions or van der Waals that put those two together, that put this triplet of UUU together with this particular amino acid. So for example, you could imagine a world in which UUU could be translated into, oops, alanine, maybe alanine, maybe glutam, uh, glutamic acid, maybe leucine. There is no reason why this triplet could not have corresponded to these amino acids instead of to this one. But just because the genetic code is contingent, in other words, it has there had to be something put in place like the, the tRNA and the amino acyl uh, transferases, does that, um, just because it's contingent, contingent, does that necessarily mean it's random? So in this lecture, we are going to discuss three aspects of the genetic code. First, we're gonna discuss its remarkable resiliency to any substitution mutation. Second, it's even more remarkable resiliency to the most common kinds of substitution, substitution mutations. And it's even more remarkable resiliency to mistranslation errors. So let's go ahead and dive into it. In the first part, we're going to talk about a paper by Haig and Hurst from 1991, <clears throat> which focused on general error minimization of the genetic code. So as the genetic code began to be deciphered in the 1960s, it became clear that codons that are differing by only a single base end up specifying similar amino acids, more often than random. So in this regard, the genetic code is organized to reduce the severity that any mutation to a protein coding region of DNA might have on the cell. But the question that they wanted to ask was, can we quantify this error minimization property? So researchers, they provided scores on each of the following properties of the amino acids. We had the polar requirement or hydropathy. These are two fairly similar properties, how polar they are. Molecular volume, that is how big an amino acid is. And it's isoelectric point or the pH at which the amino acid has no charge. All right, so they found, um, they quantified each one of these properties of every of each one of the 20 amino acids, which can be illustrated in this table here. So for example, for alanine, the polar requirement was 7.0, it's hydropathy 1.8, molecular volume 31, and isoelectric 6.0. Now, I'm not telling you exactly what these numbers mean, but the takeaway point from here is that each one of these amino acids, you can put a number to, to each one of these properties for all 20 amino acids. And it's important to have a number to that so that you can score the amino acid changes. Okay, so using these quantitative measurements, <coughs> they scored how well the genetic code resists mutation by considering how bad a hit you'd take if any given codon were to change by one base pair. So for example, let's calculate the average difference in polarity of the coded amino acid as UUU is changed by only one base pair. So there are nine different ways that you can change UUU by one base pair, which results in nine possible amino acids that could result from this single base substitution to UUU. So remember, this UUU 
it codes for phenylalanine. And phenylalanine has a polarity as scored by those researchers of 5.0. Okay, so there are nine different ways that this could be changed by one amino acid. You could have A U U, G U U, C U U. You could have U A U, U G U, U C U, etc. So let's go ahead and look up what different kinds of amino acids each one of these nine um, codons would code for. So if you take a look at your table for the genetic code, the first one listed, which was one base pair different from UUU, was AUU. So you look at your first code on A, your second code on U, and your third code on U, that codes for isoleucine. So in the table, we are going to write isoleucine in that spot. The next one was GUU, so you look for your G, then your U, then your U, and that is valine. So we're going to write valine in that spot. So here we'll write isoleucine, I-L-E. Next, valine. If you continue to look up these different amino acids on the chart, um, for CUU, you'll have leucine, then tyrosine, etc. And then you end up with all nine different amino acids. Now the next thing we can do is we can look at each one of these amino acids and go back to the other table and find out what is their polar requirement. So the first one is isoleucine and that has a polar requirement of 4.9. The next one being valine has a polar requirement of 5.6. And as we go down the table we can write down these numbers here, 4.9, 5.6, for leucine it was also 4.9, for tyrosine it was 5.4, etc. After having written down all the different polarities for each one of these nine amino acids that correspond to the nine different single base pair changes to that codon, then we can write down the difference in polarity between the original amino acid, phenylalanine, and the amino acid that you end up with. So phenylalanine's polarity is 5.0, so the change, if you change it to 4.9, is a change of minus 0.1. For changing to valine, that's a change of 0.6. And you can write down these changes in polarity all the way through. And so there you have all the different polarity changes in polarity. Now what you can do then is you can average all nine of these numbers and find an average change in polarity, which is equal to 0.76, right? Oops, this results in an average change in polarity of 0.76. And so that is uh, the final answer to our example problem. Um, and the reason why we went through that example is to show you what kinds of calculations these researchers wanted to do in order to test how resilient the genetic code might be to single base pair changes to errors in a single base pair, right? So what they did is they performed this sort of calculation for every single codon, and they found the overall performance for the genetic code, excuse me, for the genetic code. So in the case of polarity, the average performance was scored to be 5.19 for the pol polar requirement, right? So here is your natural genetic code, and the score was 5.19. Okay, but what do these numbers mean? How do you determine whether this number 5.19 was good? And by the way, um, you can do the same kinds of calculations for the other three types of uh, quantifications they did of each amino acid, and they found different numbers for each one of these, and we're not going to go into what that means. Okay, but, but the question is, let's, and, and we're gonna focus on this one, this polar requirement, because that's kind of the main one that they looked at. The question that you want to ask yourself is, how do you determine if this number is good or not? And the way you do that is that you make random genetic code assignments and score those. So you, you make random genetic codes. And score those genetic codes in the same way score, excuse me, 
underscore those codes. And so in the same way that you scored the natural genetic code, you want to score all of these random genetic codes as well. So how did the researchers do that? Well, they took a look at the structure of the natural genetic code, and they realized that the natural genetic code, you have UUU and UUC both coding for the same amino acid. In the natural genetic code, that codes for phenylalanine. But they didn't want to always put phenylalanine there, so they just put a number 01. So these two codons, they said, will code for amino acid 1. And then these six right here, will code for amino acid 2. These three here will code for amino acid 3, etc. And so they went through the entire genetic code and plopped down the different amino acid assignments from amino acid 1 through amino acid 20. Now they don't obviously go in order because amino acid 6 is coded for by these four codons, but is also coded for by these two over here. And then of course you have your three termination or stop codons UAA, UAG, and UGA. And so what the researchers did is they took a look at the structure of the genetic code, the natural genetic code, and they shuffled it. So they randomized which amino acids um, corresponded to amino acid 1, amino acid 2, etc. So like I said, in the natural genetic code, amino acid 1 clearly is phenylalanine. But when they shuffled these genetic codes and made them random, they assigned to amino acid 1, they said, well, that is alanine and maybe amino acid 2 is glycine, etc. And as they went through this, uh, they tried this 10,000 different times. They made 10,000 different randomized genetic codes, keeping the same structure as you see here, but randomizing the assignment for which amino acid is number one, which is number two, etc. And when they did that, they found that the natural code, the natural genetic code ranked ranked third out of 10,000. In other words, out of the 10,000 random genetic codes they put together, in terms of the polar, polar requirement, there were only two genetic codes that did better than the natural genetic code. They only found two where the change in polar requirement upon making one amino acid, sorry, one single base pair substitution uh, resulted in an average change in polar requirement less than what you would find in the natural code. So just to quote the paper, this is a very intriguing quote that comes out of the paper. They say, the natural code is very conservative with respect to the polar requirement, right? So this score for their P0 was 0 0.0002, which means there were two out of 10,000 that scored better, right? So the striking correspondence between codon assignments and such a simple measure deserves further study. And of course it did, right? Which is why in 1998, seven years later, they did another study. And so what they wanted to look at is they wanted to look at three different things in this newer study out of, in 1998. The first thing they wanted to look at is, well, okay, so back in 1991 when we did the original study, the computing power wasn't that good. And so, uh, you know, based on just practical requirements, they only looked at 10,000 different random genetic codes. Well, seven years later, the computing power was much better and so what they decided to do was to look at a million different randomized genetic codes to see if they could reproduce their original work from 1991. 